This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 46. Madame de Macumer to the Comtesse de l'Estrade. 1829. My sweet, tender René, you will have learned from the papers the terrible calamity which has overwhelmed me. I have not been able to write you even a word. For twenty days I never left his bedside, I received his last breath and closed his eyes, I kept holy watch over him with the priests, and repeated the prayers for the dead. The cruel pangs I suffered were accepted by me as a rightful punishment, and yet when I saw on his calm lips the smile which was his last farewell to me, how was it possible to believe that I had caused his death? Be it so or not, he is gone, and I am left. To you, who have known us both so well, what more need I say? These words contain all. Oh, I would give my share of heaven to hear the flattering tale that my prayers have power to bring him back to life, to see him again, to have him once more mine, were it only for a second, would mean that I could draw breath again without mortal agony. Will you not come soon and soothe me with such promises? Is not your love strong enough to deceive me? But stay, it was you who told me beforehand that he would suffer through me. Was it so indeed? Yes, it is true. I had no right to his love. Like a thief I took what was not mine, and my frenzied grasp has crushed the life out of my bliss. The madness is over now, but I feel that I am alone. Merciful God, what torture of the damned can exceed the misery in that word? When they took him away from me, I lay down on the same bed, and hoped to die. There was but a door between us, and it seemed to me I had strength to force it. But, alas, I was too young for death, and after forty days, during which, with cruel care and all the sorry interventions of medical science, they slowly nursed me back to life, I find myself in the country, seated by my window, surrounded with lovely flowers, which he made to bloom for me, gazing on the same splendid view over which his eyes have so often wandered, and which he was so proud to have discovered, since it gave me pleasure. Ah, dear René, no words can tell how new surroundings hurt when the heart is dead. I shiver at the sight of the moist earth in my garden, for the earth is a vast tomb, and it is almost as though I walked on him. When I first went out I trembled with fear and could not move. It was so sad to see his flowers, and he not there. My father and mother are in Spain. You know what my brothers are, and you yourself are detained in the country. But you need not be uneasy about me. Two angels of mercy flew to my side. The Duke and the Duchess de Soria hastened to their brother in his illness, and have been everything that heart could wish. The last few nights before the end found the three of us gathered, in calm and wordless grief, round the bed where this great man was breathing his last, a man among a thousand, rare in any age, head and shoulders above the rest of us in everything. The patient resignation of my Philippe was angelic. The sight of his brother and Marie gave him a moment's pleasure and easing of his pain. "'Darling,' he said to me, with the simple frankness which never deserted him, "'I had almost gone from life without leaving to Fernand, the barony of Macumer. I must make a new will. My brother will forgive me. He knows what it is to love.' I owe my life to the care of my brother-in-law and his wife. They want to carry me off to Spain. Ah, René, to no one but you can I speak freely of my grief. A sense of my own faults weighs me to the ground, and there is a bitter solace in pouring them out to you, poor unheeded Cassandra. The exactions, the preposterous jealousy, the nagging unrest of my passion wore him to death. My love was the more fraught with danger for him, because we had both the same exquisitely sensitive nature, we spoke the same language. Nothing was lost on him, and often the mocking shaft, so carelessly discharged, went straight to his heart. You can have no idea of the point to which he carried submissiveness. I had only to tell him to go and leave me alone, and the caprice, however wounding to him, would be obeyed without a murmur. His last breath was spent in blessing me, and in repeating that a single morning alone with me 
was more precious to him than a lifetime spent with another woman, were she even the Marie of his youth. My tears fall as I write the words. This is the manner of my life now. I rise at midday, and go to bed at seven. I linger absurdly long over meals. I saunter about slowly, standing motionless, an hour at a time, before a single plant. I gaze into the leafy trees. I take a sober and serious interest in mere nothings. I long for shade, silence, and night. In a word, I fight through each hour as it comes, and take a gloomy pleasure in adding it to the heap of the vanquished. My peaceful park gives me all the company I care for. Everything there is full of glorious images of my vanished joy, invisible for others, but eloquent to me. "'I cannot away with you Spaniards,' I exclaimed one morning, as my sister-in-law flung herself on my neck. "'You have some nobility that we lack.' "'Ah, Renée, if I still live, it is doubtless because heaven tempers the sense of affliction to the strength of those who have to bear it. Only a woman can know what it is to lose a love which sprang from the heart and was genuine throughout, a passion which was not ephemeral, and satisfied at once the spirit and the flesh. How rare it is to find a man so gifted that to worship him brings no sense of degradation. If such supreme fortune befall us once, we cannot hope for it a second time. Men of true greatness, whose strength and worth are veiled by poetic grace, and who charm by some high spiritual power, men made to be adored, beware of love, love will ruin you and ruin the woman of your heart. This is the burden of my cry, as I pace my woodland walks. And he has left me no child. That love, so rich in smiles, which rained perpetual flowers and joy, has left no fruit. I am a thing accursed. Can it be that, even as the two extremes of polar ice and torrid sand are alike intolerant of life, so the very purity and vehemence of a single-hearted passion render it barren as hate? Is it only a marriage of reason, such as yours, which is blessed with a family? Can heaven be jealous of our passions? There are wild words. You are, I believe, the one person whose company I could endure. Come to me, then. None but Renée should be with Louise in her sombre garb. What a day when I first put on my widow's bonnet! When I saw myself all arrayed in black, I fell back on a seat and wept till night came and I weep again as I recall that moment of anguish. Good-bye. Writing tires me. Thoughts crowd fast, but I have no heart to put them into words. Bring your children. You can nurse baby here without making me jealous. All that is gone. He is not here, and I shall be very glad to see my godson. Philippe used to wish for a child like little Armand. Come, then. Come, and help me to bear my woe. End of letter 46. Read on August 30th, 2007, in Oceanside, California.